When word comes from below to proceed, the order to lower away is given by the weapons officer. He checks to be sure the missile is moving in the right direction. The assistant weapons officer is at the launcher control panels. The umbilical access is left open so an observer can follow the missile's descent. Special attention is paid when the launch stowage adapters go by to be sure there is no binding. Topside, the weapons officer can follow the missile's progress through that small access in the liner. When the base of the missile nears the bottom of the launcher tube, a limit switch in the hoist automatically stops the motor. Someone has to take a look inside the eject chamber. What will he look for? We'll diagram it. This is the support ring of the tube seen from below. Notice the slot that has been milled into it. Now at the base of the missile, you can see the conduit. The conduit must clear the slot if the missile is to rest on the support ring. When it doesn't, and the misalignment is substantial, the missile is hoisted back into the loading fixture which is then rotated to correct the error. A small misalignment can be corrected with the alignment tool you will see shortly. But let's assume the conduit will slide into the slot. No movement is allowed until the eject chamber is clear. Then the missile is lowered until an alarm signals it is seated on the support ring. The lights on the launcher control panel change. Missile away goes out and denoted comes on. There's one last job to do before the loading fixture is removed. Fine alignment of the missile by means of the precise optical system of the submarine and an alignment tool consisting of a bracket mounted to the hoisting frame a triangular fence that's clamped onto the access door frame, and a torque wrench hooked into the bracket. This missile will be rotated slightly counterclockwise. Topside raises the missile several inches. The fence is fixed against the wrench. As the missile is lowered again, it is torqued about four minutes of arc. It may be necessary to repeat this procedure a number of times to get the necessary correction. The optical trolley will show when alignment is within the allowable tolerance. The alignment tool can now be removed. Then the hoisting frame is detached from the missile and raised out of the launch tube.
are almost ready to wrap it up. If they have not been installed earlier, the umbilical cables are installed in the retract mechanism so that water and electrical service are available to the missile. Then the umbilical is mated to the missile. The mechanical interlocks between the access doors are re-established. And the loading fixture topside can be removed from the submarine. It will be taken back to the Naval Weapons Annex to be used again. The launcher tube extension can be moved over to the next tube to be loaded. When all 16 missiles have been taken aboard, plastic supports are placed around the re-entry body to cushion it against shocks. An O-ring seal for the diaphragm is carefully installed. Then the diaphragm itself is lowered into place. The diaphragm completes the enclosure around the missile so proper temperature and humidity can be maintained. It also prevents water from entering the tube just before the missile is launched. Detonators to break the diaphragm the instant the missile is launched are now installed following exact procedures outlined in the manual. One of the last jobs is to take the guidance capsules aboard. They are heated electrically in transit because their temperature must be kept constant. They come aboard through the after access hatch. Once aboard, the capsules are installed immediately in the missiles. The physical loading of the 16 Polaris missiles is now complete, but when the submarine puts to sea, a long routine of regular testing will begin. For it's constant testing and proper maintenance that will keep the missiles ready to launch.